I'm Alex Mosed, and welcome to Winner Take All. Please welcome Randy Altschuler, the co-founder and CEO of Zometry, a publicly traded platform business with a current market cap of roughly $3 billion. Randy is also a serial entrepreneur. He's co-founded two other startups, which also had exit events, except those other two were acquired as opposed to an IPO that he's had recently with Zometry. Randy, great to have you on. Thanks for joining. Alex, thanks so much for having me. So, Randy, you know, let's let's start at the top. What's the getting started story? How did you identify this opportunity to bring this marketplace model to the manufacturing and, and contract manufacturing industry? Yeah, Alex, I think as you talked about uh, in the beginning in the introduction, I spent my career taking in, in my previous two businesses looking at large industries that hadn't been touched yet by technology. And in this particular case, you're looking at on-demand or custom manufacturing. It's a $260 billion market worldwide, highly fragmented, uh, super inefficient. And this is an instance where the long tail of the internet hadn't yet touched all of these hundreds of thousands of small manufacturers who make these small parts and hadn't helped all the customers from large Fortune 10 companies to startups to engineers working out of their dorm rooms hadn't touched it either. So we, so together with Lauren Zurf, who I co-founded the company with, we said, hey, here's an opportunity, very inefficient market, antiquated analog, and can we digitize it, bring it online and create value for both sides in a marketplace, which enables buyers to uh, take advantage of all the capabilities of these hundreds of thousands of sellers would be very appealing. And likewise, for these sellers, these small manufacturers that are effectively uh, stuck with their local customer base, they don't have a lot of dollars to invest in sales and marketing. Uh, many of these businesses have been around for generations. Now, the long tail of the internet will finally hit them and touch them, and they can access customers from all around the country and potentially around the world. So it just seemed like a perfect situation to digitize it, bring it online and create a marketplace. The space is amazing. Uh, manufacturing is so important for, for the future of this country and just, you know, uh, business model innovation. I've listened to other interviews with you. I've read through a lot of materials on Zometry. And the interesting thing when you speak about AI and, and, and my understanding of, you know, one, one really good example about how you're bringing technology, particularly in that core transaction is that when a customer is submitting kind of a request saying, Hey, you know, I need this part for, for a prototype or I'm doing or a product I'm building that Zometry is actually leveraging its AI and its, um, uh, understanding of its supplier network to, to kind of auto magically respond to that customer and say, yes, we'll be able to fill this. And maybe, you know, add some price or some lead time information in there before you've actually sourced that one on one supplier from your network. But you want to give that kind of instant or, or more instant feedback to the customer. Is that accurate? Is that one of the, the, those examples where you're using AI? How, how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the difficulties in the market and the reason why it is uh, hasn't been brought online or, or digitized prior to Zometry is this is for custom manufacturing. So when you go to a, a typical retail site online, it's Amazon or walmart.com or whatever it is, you're, you're purchasing SKUs and those SKUs have a, a price. And uh, so you can have that instant experience of I'm going to fill my shopping cart online. I'm going to check out, I'm going to pay and I'm done. In this case, the customer is creating his or her own part and her own assembly. So there is no market price for it. It's not buying a quart of milk or, or a pair of sneakers. It's like you're inventing your own thing and suddenly you're trying to find out how much and how long would it take for this to be made. And so in the past, that negotiation or pricing would take hours, days, or weeks as you go back and forth over email or phone calls or even face to face. So we're using artificial intelligence 
to create that instant price so that the customer, the buyer, can have that e-commerce-like experience that they're used to having in so many other elements of their life. And likewise, we're using that AI to give the seller, the manufacturer, an instant offer as well, because it's just as time consuming for them to create the price as it is from the customer. And then finally, we're using that AI to create the optimal match between the buyer and the seller. So once the buyer gets that instant price and he or she buys the parts or assembly, then we use that AI to find the optimal manufacturer and to give that manufacturer the price as well. So it, it, it enables both of them to have that kind of experience that they see in so many other elements of their life. And that's what power is the online experience. Such a great example, right? It, there's so much more nuance to say, yeah, you're just matching buyers and, and suppliers, right? How are you, you really using technology to solve kind of these age old classical challenges that have plagued the industry or have made that, that, that kind of purchasing and conversion flow much more difficult. And that's also, I think, because of that model that you have, uh, you have a tendency to see this concept of GMV with marketplaces. When you're reporting your financials, you know, your revenue is really speaking to the total throughput going through Zometry. And I think, you know, that, that workflow that you just described, it kind of builds the, the reasoning and the logic behind why, you know, you're recognizing that as revenue um, as opposed to, let's say, GMV that you would see like an Amazon, uh, well, they don't really truly report to it. But that GMV concept is is less uh, relevant in this model. Is is that um, how, you, how you view it and why the reporting is that way also? Well, Zometry is the seller of note for a lot of what we do. So we are, when a customer comes to our site, going back to that experience, he or she doesn't want to wait to find out whether or not the price is accepted, et cetera. So Zometry comes in and says, hey, here is the price. We're going to guarantee the price to you. We're going to guarantee the quality, the delivery, the lead time, and we're going to be the seller of note to you. So when you're looking at these industries and our buyers are you know, from auto, automotive and aerospace and defense and medical devices, robotics is important, and they're making critical parts, they want to have uh, that surety of transactions. So Zometry provides that. And then likewise uses its technology to find the best seller or manufacturer to make those parts. We were talking about a $260 billion market here. Your revenue growth has been phenomenal. I think you had 76% year over year revenue growth. Your Q4 revenue is about 50 million versus your Q1 was basically half that. You know, when you view that expansion to going after this $260 billion opportunity, what are some of those key steps on that journey? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you have the timeline a little bit off, but that's, that's totally fine. So from 2018, 2020, we grew about 92% on a compound annual growth rate. And then our Q2 revenue, which we just reported out, was, uh, was a little bit over $50 million. So that was uh, growth from last year. So, uh, so look, we, there's a lot of levers for us to continue to grow rapidly year over year. Uh, first of all, you know, we're investing and in going deeper within our existing customer base. So uh, returning accounts represent anywhere from 93 to 96% of our revenue in any given quarter uh, for at least the last, last two years. So that's very powerful that existing accounts are, you know, people are coming back and we're going deeper within those accounts. So another metric that we reported out were the number of accounts that have more than $50,000 spend on a last 12 month basis. So that number has grown a lot, not only year over year, but even sequentially quarter over quarter. So growing within existing accounts, land what people uh, traditionally call land expand strategy, that's important to us, as well as bringing new customers on board uh, as well. And then we're also adding additional products for both our buyers and our sellers uh, to increase the stickiness. Um, and to find additional ways to monetize and, and, and be more of their one-stop enterprise solution. So I wanna be an enterprise solution both for a Fortune 500 company so that they can do all their on-demand or custom manufacturing needs via the Zometry marketplace. But likewise for a seller, a machine shop or a small manufacturer, I wanna help them meet as many of their needs as I can, not only helping them be their sales and marketing, giving them, bringing them customers, 
uh, but also uh, enabling them to buy the tools and materials they need uh, to operate their shop at reduced prices and also giving them, we have a, a suite of financial products to help them with their cash flow as well. Yeah, I saw you, you've done a few acquisitions, um, at least one of which was around, you know, uh, your last point or your second to last point there about, uh, right, bringing more supplies to your producer base, those small manufacturers. You've seen probably a lot of uh, corp dev war stories over the years, whether maybe at Zometry or or your other businesses, any fun stories you can share there from from your corp dev experiences as, as you've looked at growth? No, look, I think, uh, you know, certainly for me, uh, the management team or the men and women who are running the business, when you look at an acquisition, that's very important. Um, because when you when you do a transaction, particularly when you're doing smaller transactions, and, and uh, that they are the heart of that business. Um, so uh, making sure that you are compatible with them, making sure that you have a shared vision, making sure that you can work together. Um, and I think it's also very incumbent, incumbent on the acquirer to, to enable that person to still feel like they have control over their business, they're empowered, um, that this acquisition is not only a good liquidity event for them, immediately, but also that there's long-term potential working together because you want to get them excited and you want to get their employees, some of whom have worked with them for, for sometimes decades, excited as well. So that's really important, empowering those folks and working closely with them, making them feel like they're, they're part of a team, that it's not just that they just got bought, but that they've been uh, joined together with, with you and, and making sure they share your vision. That's always really important. You mentioned that on, on the customer side, you're kind of expanding into other products. Does that reference at all 3D printing? Um, do you see that as a growing opportunity kind of in, in the suite of offerings from Zometry? Yeah, so, so you know, we've offered 3D printing for a long time, but we're continuing to add, even within 3D printing, but in other areas, new processes, new materials, new finishes. So in the second quarter, we added over 60 new materials, finishes, and processes. So uh, 3D printing in particular um, has many different uh, kinds of it today, and there's a lot of innovation in it. So there's some great new hardware companies, some of which come, have gone public recently, uh, some of which raise a lot of money, a lot of capital. So you're going to see both on the plastic side and the metal side, where there's a lot of uh, untapped potential there or opportunity that. And so we're trying to incorporate that into our platform. That's really helpful for customers in particular, because the, the landscape of manufacturing is changing in terms of what's available and how you can make things. So in the geometry marketplace, we give the customer the ability to, if he or she's got a part and they've heard about 3D printing, you know, is this cheaper? Is it faster? What are the properties of the materials? You know, what, are, what kind of finishing can get done? What kind of inspection? They can use our marketplace and actually compare different processes and see the, the opportunity there. And since we're a marketplace, since uh, we're able to bring on those technologies in a very efficient way. Uh, so we're agnostic at the end of the day about which technologies uh, you know, people buy. We just want to find the best one for them. And a marketplace enables you to, to, to uh, offer a maximum number of, of, of possibilities of options to your customers. I think your point there on the on the kind of ever evolving landscape of of manufacturing, and so you added sixty different kind of products and finishes and 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 more option optionality, kind of that more product selection, uh, might you say, for your customer base. The classic platform challenge is this chicken or the egg uh, problem. It it doesn't go away; it just continues to repeat itself in a myriad of different iterations, as I'm sure you're very familiar with. When you look at the business is and, and you say, yeah, I got $260 billion market here. Is that more so pushing on the supply side? I see, you know, you say you have over 5,000 suppliers currently on the platform. You know, is where would you say between the demand or the supply, you know, what, what's that bigger area that you want to really focus on over the, you know, short to midterm here? Yeah, look, I think in a two-sided marketplace, and 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 this really is very much a two-sided. I mean, we have to we have to give a price 
a delivery date, an option that's attractive to the buyer, but we have to do the same thing for the seller. Otherwise, there's nobody to make the parts. So in that instance, it really is coordinating both. We can't just run out and get a gazillion buyers and have not enough sellers. And likewise, if we have all these sellers here um, and there are no buyers, the sellers are gonna be turned off and aren't gonna be uh, loyal and active in the, in the market. So, uh, you know, we, we try to orchestrate both sides, uh, ensuring that we have plenty of capacity. I mean, that's one of the, the nice things about our marketplace. We're never, we never shut down things. Even in the middle of COVID, we were always open for business. There's effectively no limitation of capacity. On the other hand, I don't want my sellers to feel like we're not an important enough, um, that zometry is not important enough to them. So I, I, I got to be careful, but I got to move them both. Um, otherwise, I will have an issue later on. The different ways that, that zometry was able to help solve um, uh, a whole slew of supply chain challenges, uh, given your business model, maybe as opposed to more of the kind of traditional alternatives, you know, to, to how these buyers and sellers or, you know, manufacturers were operating pre COVID, right. Uh, any, um, any particularly kind of shining examples where you thought Zometry's value prop, this marketplace model for contract manufacturing really, really shined through during, during COVID and all these supply chain issues that, that continue to this day. It wasn't just an international shutdown. You know, a lot of people historically have, have purchased things in China. And then it, if we remember back when COVID first started, it was actually on the heels of the Chinese New Year. And China shut down for an extended period of time. It traditionally does around the New Year anyway, but shut down for a much longer period of time because of COVID, went into lockdown. So you had a lot of American customers and European customers who had, who had traditionally sourced their parts in China. And suddenly they were locked out. And so they were able to transition to the Zometry marketplace, access manufacturers in 46 different states. Again, we have a similar thing in Europe. I think that was very attractive. But also here within the United States, then you saw a cascade of states shutting down and it wasn't, it wasn't done at a federal level, it was done state by state, by different regulation, different timing. So then you saw customers would source their parts domestically here in a particular state, lose their source there as well. And so that was also another opportunity for people to say, okay, you know, zometry has got um, sellers or manufacturers in many different places, even if it gets shut down in, you know, California, uh, there are folks who are available in Idaho uh, or in Oregon or whatever. So, so, so I think, look, I think the one thing that COVID if there's anything that's positive out of a disaster and there's very, very few things, but it, it, but it has underscored for people the need to have a resilient local supply chain. Um, you know, we had gotten into a point where in the, in the, uh, in the quest to optimize dollars, um, you know, supply chains became very convolute, uh, complicated and fragile, you know, so if you could get the very best price, um, and if, and if there was enough uh, transportation, so I would source it from very far away because it would be worth it. When I ran the calculation, even if I had to travel a gazillion miles, it would still be worth it. Now with COVID, uh, and frankly with climate change, you're seeing, hey, there's externalities, there are shocks, there are what are, were once in a lifetime black swan events, now they're gonna happen more frequently. Boy, you better have a supply chain that can absorb that. Um, and so I think more and more companies are learning that and that will empower local manufacturing here in the United States. That should give local manufacturers some extra uh, demand from, from customers. Yeah, I want to come back to uh, zometry.org uh, and, and also touch on that. The other point that you were making, though, we do a lot of work with different B2B distributors. And, you know, what I keep hearing is that these supply chain challenges are continuing for them. You know, the, the cost of getting goods in, you know, on ships and containers, and then the, the trucking and, and all the logistics that goes into it from the, you know, from the marine terminal to wherever it needs to go, just continues to be a challenge as opposed to, you know, things settling back down and kind of normalizing 
these uh, reverberations are, are continuing throughout all of their different kind of distribution and, and manufacturer relationships. Is that something that, that you're also seeing? You know, it's, it's, it's different disturbances, but all the like, you're still seeing these supply chain, particularly these supply chain compu- complications that stem from this international component, just bringing more of that demand to say, let me find this on a localized basis, whether it's localized, you know, in the U.S. or now with your business uh, growing in Europe, same kind of trend. That seems like a trend that you'd be pretty bullish on in from your looking glass. Is that right? Yeah, look, I think and, and you're still seeing shortages in things like materials or plastics, things that people need for injection molding. So there are pretty uh, and in other areas of manufacturing, there are some some rather severe material shortages, which are continuing to create some delays for people. Uh, absolutely, I think those trends are are good for a marketplace in the sense that, um, and we provide that you have a local option as well as a, a international option too. Uh, the question will be whether or not uh, companies, you know, it's an inconvenience now, and so, in the immediate term, people are forced to switch to a local option because they can't get it fast enough uh, from their traditional overseas supplier. The question is, once, you know, knock on wood, things go back to quote unquote normal, will that stay or will it just fleetingly go back to the way it was and then we'll wait for the next event? Um, I'm hoping that it will stay. I'm hoping people are learning that, um, but we'll see. And, and by the way, that also means you know, if we're going to absorb and thinking about here as, as an American, if we're going to absorb a lot of the manufacturing demand that, that went overseas and we're going to bring it back here to the States, that means we need to we need to do better here on the manufacturing side in terms of we need more manufacturers. We need more uh, young people who are learning and, and wanting to be in manufacturing when they graduate from high school or even if they don't you know, go to high school, whatever it may be, that that, that becomes their career choice. Um, you know, those and we need a better infrastructure, those investments we need to make to ensure that if we do find more uh, demand for local, and I, I think that is going to be an inevitable, even if it doesn't happen right now, I think it will, because again, of things like climate change, these things are going to force it, uh, that we're prepared for it and we aren't caught short like we were, you know, with things like personal protection equipment, where we literally didn't have enough in the United States, literally, you know, they were short. Um, We cannot allow that sort of thing to happen as we move into the future. And this is where perfect segue, Zometry.org. This is the charitable arm of Zometry, which is, I know, putting engineering education initiatives together, which is working on climate change initiatives. When did that start? Uh, You know, what what else would you want to expand on in terms of the exciting stuff that the charitable arm is working on? Yeah, there, there's an organization called Pledge 1%, where companies uh, pledge 1% of their equity to uh, to invest in, in, in causes uh, that will help, you know, help our community, help our planet. And so uh, we've pledged uh, up to 1% of our of the equity that we issued in the IPO to uh, Zometry.org. Uh, we created that, that organization. And so and if you go to Zone Street Hour, you can see it. And, and so we are dedicating that to, to various causes that are important to us and hopefully to our communities. Some of that is, is fighting climate change. And we have some mechanism within the Zone Street marketplace to empower both, to empower our, our customers to, to buy carbon offsets of their manufacturing. Zone Street itself is, is paying to offset the, the shipping that happens within the marketplace. Uh, but we're also supporting educational efforts uh, to ch- particularly for underrepresented communities that traditionally haven't been uh, as strong as they could be uh, in manufacturing, in engineering. And so putting money behind that, that uh, donating to, to, to causes or to organizations that sponsor that, uh, that's another core part of our mission as well. And, and to your point in the theme of, you know, how do we uh, empower manufacturing here in the United States and get everybody involved in that. You know, to play that out, right? You're saying, hey, right now there's a convenience factor. And, you know, when will you actually get your order if you place it overseas? Um, there's just a lot of uncertainty associated with that. So when you take that out of the equation, 
what are those biggest inhibitors to um, to really bring back manufacturing, at least in the air, you know, this on demand and contract manufacturing space is, is it the labor? Is it also the technology or the, the machines and, and the, uh, you know, the maturity of that technology to process, you know, what, what these customers are needing? Are there other things there that you think just need, whether it's your efforts from the charity standpoint or just, other efforts or in areas that need further investment to to kind of bring up parity. Well, certainly, and 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 most of pre-COVID, you know, this was still the case as well. Most of what we, most of our sellers are here in the United States, and most of what's produced for our customers in the United States. Uh, but as you get to higher quantities and you get to true contract manufacturing, you know, that's where a lot of this is, has moved overseas. And the number one issue is price. Um, it is cheaper. And so, um, you know, there's two parts to that equation. One is, well, actually, it's a, a few different parts. One is, is, is a uh, corporation, what is, you know, are they willing to pay more for something? That's, that's doubtful or, or, you know, it's questionable when they're thinking about their shareholders, when they are, when they are, uh, when they are uh, judged on different criteria than, hey, we want to make a strong American manufacturing uh, local network, or if you're in Europe, same, same similar, similar calculus. Um, the other thing is, is the consumer willing to pay more? So, you know, you always hear a lot of people talking about, I, I want things made in America. Then when they make that, that decision on what to buy, price is king or queen. And, um, you know, so we have to consciously make decision. Is it worth it to spend more uh, if we can influence where that's made uh, to our betterment? And I think the third thing is, and, and again, I'm, I'm going to go back to climate change because I think this is such an existential threat. The, the seeming cost of, of procuring something from far away is not captured in today's prices. So there is no cost of the extra carbon emission from something traveling you know, on an airplane or a cargo ship from halfway across the world versus from you getting it down the street. That's not, that cost isn't captured. That is a real cost. And the manufacturing requirements or, or maybe lesser so um, that exists elsewhere around the world versus, you know, what we have for carbon emissions in the well, U.S. That's, that's right. Just right. So, so when we start putting that into, uh, into the calculus and when uh, we assign a true cost and there is a true cost, it's not like a, just being a good human being cost, but it's, there's a true environmental damage cost, and we're paying for that with, you know, these rampant fires across the country and the hottest summer ever, et cetera. When we start putting that, that may force the hand, that, that may change the price equation itself if that becomes, if, if there's a government intervention or other things where that has a, a cost assigned to it. Um, I guess going back to one other thing you said, even if all the stars aligned and manufacturing, you know, everything did start flooding back here. Yeah, as I sort of talked about, we, we need to, we as parents, and I have three children, and, and we need to reinforce for our young people that a career in manufacturing is a noble one. It is an aging workforce, right? We, right now we have in manufacturing. And, and the people that run these machines are uh, very technically sound. These are complicated machines. They are as much artists as they are manufacturers. I mean, this is a true art. It is a true trade. And uh, the satisfaction, the importance of producing these critical parts should something we should be celebrating, but we don't like we, you know, the, the, the too much. It's about going to a, a four years and doing liberal arts. There's nothing wrong with that, but there has to be a, a greater, uh, we have to go into other areas as well. And we have to celebrate that as parents and as, as people in our country. Um, and then we also have to make sure, you know, because we have a dearth of those workers and, and, you know, how many entrepreneurs dream to open up their own manufacturing shop? Not a lot. So, um, the physical amount of capacity isn't here enough as well. Like we need to make sure we get more, if, if there is this in, influx, we need to make sure we just have more manufacturing here. And again, uh, all of us can play a role in that, uh, to, 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 to create that because America has that that capability, right? We have, you know, 
we can do it, but we've got to get some energy behind it. On the carbon emissions, I have seen there actually are a number of interesting, still relatively early stage um, tech startups that, you know, I know particularly in Europe, more of the kind of metal service centers, metal distributors, the mills are getting requests from their customers and are and are kind of putting into place uh, some of that kind of supply chain transparency so that you could actually start to understand some or begin to just have some visibility on the carbon emissions, at least in the, in the metal supply chain, which I've become pretty familiar with. So that's positive. I've seen that more so starting in Europe, but I think it'll it'll also kind of slowly come over here, hopefully. And then the other point you're making, you know, is is not only to kind of make make it cool to uh, you know to to build things and manufacture things. There's also a huge disparity in the amount of federal subsidies when you look at you know those kind of liberal arts uh, college education institutions versus more of these trade schools, right? And and just and I think to your point. To, to the other initiative that Zometry.org is working on is how are you bring that engineering education? How are we investing in the trade schools? How are we not only from a from a branding and a, and a and a and a kind of conceptual spirit around it, saying this is a this is a reputable and honorable trade with a lot of opportunity because there's a you know <laughs> there's a seemingly uh, you know lack of this uh, certainly relative to the demand, but also then investing in it and providing these programs, which is Another great thing just to hear what what Zometry is working on and and um, and and the stock grant and all these kinds of things. Oh, absolutely. Uh, no, I think those are all great points, and and uh, you know we'll, we'll just have to get there. I mean, I'm hopeful we will. When you look at that crossing of the chasm, which I think is that really interesting dynamic, where hey. Here are the on-demand things. Hey, I'm prototyping a product. Hey, I need this quickly or I need a replacement part, right? That's really where Zometry has cut its teeth. And the funny thing is, I feel like if I look at an Alibaba, like a like a um, Taobao or, you know, some of their initial uh, like B2B marketplaces is actually some of where really Alibaba first started. They have They have a number of different marketplaces, as I'm sure you're familiar with. But it was really around kind of connecting manufacturers with customers was some of the first iterations of of Alibaba, which might be more so for those larger production oriented type orders as opposed. I mean, I'm sure there was both in there and still is. But yeah, that that kind of crossing the chasm moment where we can, you know, see changes or shifts in large scale production, which really happens very selectively in the United States. And even if it does you know, there's there's a lot of nuance and parts coming in from all over the place, um, but that's something that I've personally been very passionate about seeing. And how can technology, how can new business models like what Zometry is doing help to make you know that future a reality? So, you know, I t- I what I take your two hundred sixty billion dollar number, I kind of assume that maybe somewhere in there, maybe it's a few steps down the road. If you're starting the relationship with these customers, right, and you have the visibility on here's the stuff they're prototyping, here's the stuff that they need, you know, you you eventually and, and you're growing with them to your point on, you know, customers spending over fifty thousand dollars and and that number growing quite successfully, you know, it, it's a natural, hopeful growth point and growth opportunity for Zometry as you just kind of proceed throughout that whole uh, customer journey, which would really be phenomenal. As uh, you know, as as the company grows and has multiple types of transactional models, yeah, we're we're definitely doing more and more production work. To your point, as we go with, uh, as we grow with our customers, as they become more comfortable with us. I mean, part of that's also a comfort element. Uh, you know, you're not going to try Zometry for the first time and and make a hundred thousand of a critical part. You're gonna you're gonna prototype, but we definitely have more and more customers who are spending more or less as a result of moving to production. Um, I will go back to what I said earlier though, when you look at true giant contract manufacturing, it's the iPhone or things like that. And forget about Zometry for a second, but for that work to return to the United States, we need to do some work here as a country to, to bring it back. And uh, you know, we have to sort of readjust our expectations from a pricing perspective and, and what we value and what we don't value. Uh, so. Something to think about. Yeah, I've covered on the show 
um, you know, tracking, for example, you know, you go to an Amazon, you go to a Walmart, how easy or not easy is it to, 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 to sort and find products that are made in America, for example? You know, Amazon does have a, a, a made in America store, but it's buried. You know, you really got to go in there and then you can subscribe to it and, and try and navigate back to it. But it is certainly something that is, is going to require a whole spectrum of change from the from the consumer to the capability and everything in between if that's going to start to become more commonplace absolutely hopefully you know zometry is really at at the forefront certainly on the production and 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 kind of supply chain side of this to to make that a reality absolutely look i think the fact that we're supporting and helping all these small manufacturers uh, will help them as a local option be more powerful. Hopefully, you know, with our financial products and other things, we're giving them better cash flows so they can invest in growing their businesses, buying more equipment, buying some of that new equipment. You know, they're hearing about 3D printing. You're seeing more and more manufacturers who have 3D printing as part of their offering because that metal part that might be made, you have to use uh, traditional, you have to machine off the, the support and you have to post process. So, so there's a lot of crossover. Um, and so if we can empower those manufacturers, give them the resources to participate in the new you know, manufacturing 3.0 or 4.0, I can't remember what number we're up to at this point, then, then that will be good. And, and we don't want that just to be for the giant companies. We want to allow those small multi-generational, uh, you know, historical mom and pop uh, businesses thrive as well. Randy, it was, you know, such a pleasure. Thank you so much for sparing the time and, and, and telling us and, and t- walking us through more about Zometry, all the amazing things you guys are doing over there and gals. Really such a great thing to see this, this B2B, this marketplace model and, uh, and, and how it got going and, and then the opportunity for it because it is a very rare thing to see. Um, particularly in this sector and how you're integrating down to the, the the manufacturing base. So any last thoughts, anything we didn't touch on today that you want to highlight? No, I think these are great questions and and I'm excited that you're excited about, about manufacturing as, as well as marketplaces. It is such a critical part of, of the American economy and the whole world economy. And as we try to tackle some of these larger issues as a country, but as, as a species, uh, being able to have a manufacturing base that can produce the, the you know, carbon capturing devices or, or the, you know, they're going to allow us to farm smarter and all these different things, you know, you need to make that stuff. And so we want to we make sure we have here in the U.S. as well as other communities around the world that we've got the, uh, the actual firepower to do that. We wish you all the continued success, you and the team. Absolutely. We hope to have you come back on sometime in the future. Keep us posted. And uh, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Well, that was a treat. Randy Altshuler, co-founder and CEO of Zometry. That is it for us today on Winner Take All. Thank you very much for joining us.